Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, streaming, uh, Breaking Absolutes. I'm so excited today to have with me Mike Mangini, uh, currently the drummer for Dream Theater. But as, as you've heard me talk about, the purpose of this show really is to uh, break down stereotypes and to dimensionalize uh, people that work in the categories of rock and metal music uh, to show the, the, the value and the emotional impact that this music really can and, and I think should have for a broader audience uh, and the people that are, that are doing this work and the broad array of interests and creative endeavors that they have. Um, to that end, I have Mike Mangini. Um, a lot of the folks that I know and that are probably watching this stream um, are Dream Theater fans. So that's not a, a there's no secret there. That's, that's uh, certainly a, a crowning achievement for, for Mike, but it's hardly the only achievement. So to frame our conversation, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go through some of the things that, that uh, the backstory for Mike and the continuing story for Mike uh, about who he is as a musician and a person. Uh, there's no possible way to do all of this because as I've done a bunch of my, as I do my look back at the, at the musician, uh, it's quite stunning to see the achievements of this, of this man. Nevertheless, uh, let me share a few as a way to begin. Uh, of course, folks will know that he's uh, been four times uh, nominated for a Grammy, twice with Dream Theater, twice with Steve Vai uh, as a, a, in an intra instrumental performances. Um, all through his high school years, um, there's no end to the number of first chairs that he's, he, he received and earned um, in, uh, as a percussionist, uh, as a rhythm section in all styles, jazz, um, rock, uh, ensemble, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I won't list, I won't name all of those just for time. Cause we want to talk with, with Mike, uh, suffice to say though, he was, he was, uh, recognized for his ability early on. Um, he is in the world's fastest drummer, um, multiple years for multiple categories. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, uh, it's 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 really just uh, these are skills. These are these are uh, they show the effort that the man has put into his craft, which is a really important thing we want to talk about later on. Um, he's been the subject of a documentary. In, interestingly and importantly, he's an educator, and we're going to talk a lot about that. He worked at Berkeley College of Music for many years in, in several capacities, um, and received among the highest ratings as as an educator there, uh, as reported by st uh, student responses. Um, he's got several instructional things. Uh, so for people who are musicians, uh, and, um, uh, they're, they're really good. But one of the things we'll talk about is how the, the processes that he's developed really can be applied elsewhere. Um, let me leave it there for now. And, uh, let's bring Mike on and kind of get into the conversation. Mike Mangini, welcome. Okay. So I, I like to do this when I have personal touch points with the artist to kind of frame some of, uh, what I think is so so amazing uh, and interesting about you. The first time we met, uh, you were you were through town on the dramatic turn of events tour, and uh, I had planned a dinner with Jordan, and um, you came along with us, and uh, we were at dinner, and you showed me what a bloody snot is. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was yes, an oyster, and um, oyster I'm with... sure you remember my <laughs> dessert ordering technique as well. Oh my gosh, you're like a chef, and the the what I gleaned from all of that is here's this guy who's, you know, arguably this is even before I knew all of the, the other accolades, but arguably in the world's premier progressive metal act. And there was just this like kind of fun, humorous, humble guy sitting across from us, uh, showing us these crazy things to eat or, you know, ordering uh, off the menu. Um, and it was about that same time, Mike, that I saw a video online, uh, of you doing this, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a uh, it was a rhythm of seventeen over nineteen, and I, I kind of broke my head just to hear it. Uh, I had no idea how you how you accomplished it. The, that's the other end of the spectrum. Like you you possess this gift and and you've cultivated this gift to a level to do this kind of work at, at such an, an, an accelerated way of thinking about rhythm. And we'll go deeper and deeper into this. But I just I think that sort of for me sort of exemplifies the range of you as a person, like you're just, uh, I've never met someone who's sort of so humorous and grounded at the same time. I'm so expert at their craft. So that's, that's the framing for everything we discuss. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So now 
the the we've already talked about um, leading to my first question, which was something I learned about you is you, you had all of this success in high school with multiple different um, combinations. It wasn't just Massachusetts. You were first chair in ensembles for the entire Eastern uh, United States. Like You were acknowledged for your ability, but then it, it seems as though you shifted focus when you went to college because you took a, a computer programming degree. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. That came from... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's just so funny how I just die and laugh at it because I can picture this in my head. But, you know, it came from a conversation with my father who uh, has an ability to kind of present facts very strongly and uh, with brevity, something I have trouble with. But he basically said, I'm not sending you to college for something you can already do. I don't think so. You, well, you, gotta, you have good, great grades. You, you, you've got to use that to fall back on. You have to learn something else. And... Being a musician, it's like, you can't do that. That's not a real job. And if it is, it's, it's, it's temptations and terrible things that happen in that life. So go learn something else. <laughs> because he's like, you know, you can already do it. Why would you? I couldn't answer the question. He said, why would you go to college for something you've already won everything at? Can you just tell me that? I'm just like, you know, I'm 18 going, uh, I guess you're right. But it proved to be a game changer for me. How so? Well, um, the interesting thing about my perception of being alive and living has a lot to do with being pulled, being put in situations, being pulled into them, uh, not understanding how that works initially. And, you know, we have a calling. What, 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 is, what is the definition of that? What does it mean? What is it made of? Where does it come from? You know, I want answers to this, and I'm not talking beating around the bush. So that, that's my, my, my thinking. It's like, wait a minute. I, I know this thing I want to achieve, but I don't know it. I don't know. If I knew it, I would probably be on my way to it. So, you know, I knew I had a calling with music. And it's interesting because when I got into college at Bentley University, um, it was, it was, I had a moment in my my calculus three class that was the same moment i had in a in a, a what was that fortran programming class imagine that that's old huh that is old and um <laughs> and then i had a similar moment in my accounting class so <laughs> all all these moments i just sort of saw the possibility that i could program myself on a binary level like arms and off i saw rhythms as ons and offs, and I saw that I understood how how binary works uh, in, in machine language and programming and things like that, and then you get into high level languages. Meaning, it was a game changer to go there because without the language of binary code or software programming in general, I would have had no chance at making my rhythm knowledge books. Just wow. it, I would not have been able to make the connection between this calling of mine and the talent and and the will to work something had to connect them so that's why it was such a game changer now my dad didn't know that all he knew was you know he had to he had to say it the way he saw it he saw it at, you know from a parent's view sure. just like this is this life is not good for you it's not best it's like no go learn something else anyway and um look, look at that um without it i couldn't have made that connection the way that I did. Now, because I quit, I quit college, and then and then went and wrote the books and did all that stuff. Anyway, well, we're, and we're going to get to the books because I think it's important. Yeah. But um, it, what one of the things that I uh, read was that that's about this time you began working uh, on on a program that studied the links between the human body and the brain. Is is this what you're talking about? Is this like your way of? Um, figuring out how you're going to connect uh, everything you know intellectually with how you're going to use your, your body to, to, to advance as a drummer? Or is this a different thing? No, this, it's, that's exactly it. It's a connection. And here's the reason. Um, I visualized the human person in a certain way. And, you know, 25 years later and 
a gazillion philosophy books later and physics books, layman stuff I'm talking about, sure. layman stuff, you know, mathematics, all that stuff. I, I love it. But um, I saw the human person in parts and the part that makes the body do things is what I modeled, um, you know, I, I, I used a computer and the way a CPU works in terms of one thought at a time in terms of well we have several applications open but the computer is working so fast you think it's all happening at the same time in a layer but it's just going at light speed so I was like wait a minute I can I can learn to play this is how I did it I can learn to be a significantly better ice hockey player if I try to understand and slow down my thoughts but I didn't know it at the time I was what nine ten eleven I don't know. <laughs> no, I didn't know any of this, but I, I, it's again, I'll say I, I knew something, but I didn't know what I knew, yeah. the calling. Um, so this was vital, this, this link between this, this programming thing I'm talking about is the answer to behavioral change. It is be, it's a behavioral change science is what it is, because if you can arrest and slow down or even understand how you get from this thought to that action, then you can make a change. How can you make a change until you can understand that process? So that's really a description of what it is that I worked on. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, and later when we get deeper into your instructional stuff, there's some, some, some studies I want to just briefly talk about that I'm guessing you know that, that um, are, are part of this conversation that I think is really illuminating, um, which I think just shows, again, like the pioneering uh, spirit that, that you've had to, I mean, because you did all of this, was this like the early 90s? Was this, or was it? Uh, let's see. You, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yes, I, I, I penned and self released, self published Rhythm Knowledge in 1997. Okay. Um, it, it was in the works for a while. And, um, you know, I, I, I needed to gain some experience out there touring, traveling around the world, stuff like that. Sure in order for me to really feel comfortable with this. But um, yeah, that's, that, that's when it, this just got published, self-published, yeah. Okay, and clearly was germinating for a while. And let's, let's, let's kind oh. of use that, yeah. um, your, your, your mention of getting out there in the world as a segue into some of your other musical efforts uh, that preceded Dream Theater. And we, there's, again, this is another place for everybody who's with us and who'll see this later uh, in podcasts and on YouTube, et cetera. This is a place where I really encourage you to go dive into Mike's uh, website because I, I can't possibly cover everything, but I'll cover some of the, some of the, some of it. Um, and the first one I want to ask about is Annihilator. Um, so as my, my research tells me that they're the best-selling Canadian thrash metal group ever. Um, you did did three records with them, um, as I understand it, um, and and was also part of the writing process on uh, it, while you were in the group. And of course, they've got more records, but uh, you you've been a part of that. The, the The question I have there is, you know, they're known as a thrash band. I, I'm I'm wondering, <clears throat> and a lot of our viewers uh, probably know you in Dream Theater. I'm wondering, like, what did is the is the approach that you take for the Annihilator music? Is it a different kind of athleticism uh, that that you use there? Uh, no, I, I do need to correct. Yes. Uh, Jeff Waters wrote every note, wrote every okay. lyric note, he, and even he directed me on drum hits. He even directed me on the height of one cymbal versus another. His ears are out of control. Wow. Amazing. So no, 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 no. I was, I was. Um, I was a person trying to help him realize his expression. Okay. And I, I love doing that for people. I just love seeing their faces when I can understand what they want and actually deliver it. It's, um, it's a greater joy than, and, or let's say it's a different joy than if I'm to create it all myself. So that, I just need to clear that up. Okay, that's the great. next thing is the, the athleticism and everything. Um, uh, Slightly, yes, because it involves uh, more neck pain from flicking my hair around and <laughs> head bang. <laughs> so I have to actually have to have different, a mental protocol 
really to account for those motions as if I was coordinating the hair throws. I mean, I remember shooting Set the World on Fire, that video which people can uh, see on YouTube, like Set the World on Fire, okay? And all of that, I will never forget being in that session because the director, who was, first of all, he had a great sense of humor. And, uh, you know, between takes, I'm like, that was my stomach. I'm not fat. I'm not saying all this stuff. I'm like, I can't throw my hair. I'm like, that. No, what are you guys nuts? You know. But anyway, it was so much fun, and I was timing my. You, you gotta see the video because every time you see my head go down, I was like sore for nine and a half years after filming that. So yeah, it's slightly, uh, slightly different. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I went and watched that video, uh, and there are places you had the hair stuff going and at, at some one point you were so active behind the kit the only way i knew it was you was i could see your nose <laughs> yeah it's the um but i, I have it that's, too that's the that's that that's that's the dna that's that's, that's the, the um italian you know 90 percent yeah or, although i always thought it was 100 percent, but i guess nobody's nobody is anyway yeah yeah okay um okay so let's let's move forward in time then to your time with extreme um you on in that uh, when you were with Extreme, um, correct me, Gimma, but I do think you have a song writing credit on "Leave Me Alone." Yes. Okay. So, sorry. Go ahead. You were about to say something. I was just going to say that that was that that that's true, because this entire song was written around a simple sounding beat that involved me opening and closing two hi hats on this symmetrical kit. That, to my knowledge. Is a is was never ever 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 done like that before because nobody really fulfilled uh, the obligations of completely learning their uh, to turn their body to completely opposite muscle groups at the time that I knew. I mean, how do I know? There could have been a hundred and forty two people on the planet that did this, and we don't know who they are. I mean, I don't know, but. It was a really, uh, that beat sounds so simple, but it was written around that. Nuno Betancourt then called for his tech and said, get me the, you know, you know the Illudium 238 flanger, whatever he was, whatever he got, the pedal. He needed some thing to step on, so he got that sound. And then Gary, this is hilarious, Gary went to his thin leather briefcase and opened it and pulled out the lyric and said, I have a lyric. And in five minutes, the song was done. Oh, wow. It was, a, it was I just, I remember this like it's a video clip playing in my mind. It was really great fun. Yeah, it's a, it's a great song. Um, and I, I guess one of the things I wonder is, is extreme, you know, the, everybody knows they had a great deal of commercial success. Um, when you were riding with them, it's a very different. It's a very different rock music than Annihilator, um, and I'm wondering, like, how how you sort of calibrated um, what you did for that sound relative to where you'd been with Annihilator. Well, where I was with Annihilator can be described um, if you if you take um, uh, a ruler and you have you know an old school wooden ruler. Right from fifth grade, and you know, it's, it's you can see where all the inch marks are, if, unless you're, of course, in Europe. Then you've got centimeters. And anyway, so if you take that and divide a space, okay, annihilator required me to hit my notes exactly on the perfect divisions of that space. Okay. Extreme required some of the notes to morph and breathe more. Okay. Okay. They had a different. It had, it's had a different feeling, and so it wasn't as uh, demanding on the grid. So that's the main physical. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the the main difference with the placement of the notes. Okay. So. Uh, what else? What else did you ask me? Well, that was the main thing. I. I um, right. You know, I think these. I'm kind of building to something here with with looking oh. at your at your musical back, backstory a little bit. Again, not yeah. all of it, but just some some of it. Um, you then spent some years with Steve Vai, uh, mm -hmm. and with Steve, you know, there was a kind of a super group, um, live ensemble, uh, that you were part of. And then you appeared on the fire garden and the ultra zone, uh, records and on the live alive in ultra world records. Right. Um, yeah. Eight of them, eight, eight altogether, just different pieces. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so a lot of work with Vi and Vi's known. At least one of the things he's known for is 
being experimental. He he's one of the things I remember him for is his um, sixteen um, note octave fractal guitar um, and you know oh. writing some stuff like that. And uh, it, that's not the all of who Vi is, but certainly like he's been a guy who's tried to push the envelope in really interesting ways. And it led me to wonder about your time there. Um, it's it, it's yet again a very, seems to me a, a very different opportunity as a drummer with in terms of the music you were working with. And I was hoping you'd maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Oh yeah, I can. First of all, my experiences stem from uh, I guess a, it's not just a state of mind, but it's a state of heart, I suppose, where I really want to work with them. I really want to learn, I want to offer, I want to show whatever it is I can do, I want to be a part of things. Um, and you know, Steve, first of all, when you say a word, I have an image flash in my mind, I just see him laughing. He has his sense of humor, he's a very generous, kind person, uh, and we all know how talented Steve is as well. So it's important for me to say that because um, when I met him, it was, it was the day I was recording the Fire Garden Suite, which I didn't have, you know, I didn't sit down and learn that or practice that. He sent me some cassette tapes with FedEx. And, you know, I had put my cassette tape and I'm listening. And um, I, I wanted to know what I was getting into because I, if I, sometimes if I practice too much before, the person, the person who I'm essentially working for and trying to help express their idea changes everything anyway. So, um, I went in, and we're talking. We're talking about <clears throat> ridiculously complex um, uh, pockets of, of 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 drum hitting of notes that fit in odd amounts of spaces. And you know, me, he's asking me, "All right, there's an eleven top, but that this can you can you hit that splash symbol on the seventh note?" And we would start to giggle and do like t television impressions. And things like that. So you you got to understand that the humor humor has been a, a big part of this, and what allows these dense uh, topics to have a just some some I don't know a sense of reality to them. And like, okay, yeah. we we understand that this is crazy stuff, but it, it's just what it is. It's just you know people that view something the same way because they earned. The privilege of viewing it. Certain things we view, you have to earn the privilege. You can't have the view yeah. from the top of Mount Everest unless you climb it. You right. can't have it. I mean, you can see a, a reproduction. You don't. You don't. You don't earn it. You can't forget it. Okay. So anyway, we know that that, that, that we stand on that perch, uh, having worked very hard. So that encompasses. That's you know. That's an example that really describes my five years with him was, um, was uh, just trying to work with this way of making music and trying to be the best we could at playing it. And for me, I'm working for somebody. So I am trying to help them express what they need to. And that really describes it. It's really dense material, a lot of it. Yeah. Fun. yeah. Um, I, fun. I, I love Vi, and I love what you did with Vi. Um, and I think it's, you know, again, we're only hitting certain areas, but it, it shows another really different musical side of you uh in in your work with that with vi relative to what you've done before okay yeah I, I forgot to add that in last time um it shows the orchestral side in other words um if i can go backwards the annihilator side of me had to be learned i didn't know about milliseconds and being late um uh, and playing perfectly metronomic i did not know about that after that session i practiced I got a four track and I put my metronome on 40 beats a minute and then slowed it down and tried to get 10 hits in a row, just 10 hits in a row to land perfectly in time. You know, and as anyone that's a musician would understand, I couldn't get two. <laughs> it took a, you know, that led to a whole nother thing. But extreme, that took um, sort of like uh, my sister would give me, like brother and sister would give me albums and I was very, very, very young. But my sister kind of, had me listen to Motown. And so that, I needed a little bit of that swing or whatever for the extreme stuff, you know. Um, and then with Vi, I needed the orchestral, meaning everything on this drum set that to most people is like, you know, do you, 
you know, do you use everything? Why do you have four hi hats? And I'm always getting questioned, and I, it's okay, but it's like, wait a minute, I learned and was taught how to place everything on this drum set because the kit relates to all these other notes. Like, I mean, a, a keyboard instrument has 88 keys. Right. Why should I hit? Why should I hit a, 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 a drum that sounds like a Chihuahua dog barking when the notes really low and heavy? Yeah, you know what I mean. So anyway. I got. I brought the orchestral training into uh, Vise World. That makes a lot of sense to me. The way you describe that, it also it, it also is a good analogy. I think you've got you build these these um, expansive kits that give you all these extra tools, uh, so you can be thoughtful about the choices you make. Just like a, a keyboard player can decide That's to it. go way up or way down, but they don't use those notes all the time. But when they need them, they use them. So it, that's a really good analogy, I think. Um, so now let's transition, Mike, into what you and I kind of talked about in email, like rhythm and learning, because um, this is an area where I think you're very accomplished. Um, um, you've worked as an instructor, like a, a drum instructor, as a clinician. Uh, you've done a ton of touring where you where you sort of teach uh, these concepts that you've had to kind of build in order that other people, I, I guess, can um, accelerate, um, and, and, you know, follow the process you created for, um, building their own success as a drummer. And I want to talk about how that translates to other things in life, but, but let's focus first on drums and let's talk about your rhythm knowledge volumes one and two, which by the way, uh, my notes show that uh, they, those were top, uh, top three best instructional, um, books in 1999. So in addition to what we'll learn here, like these have been sort of acknowledged as having this kind of efficacy that a drummer might want in instructional uh, materials. But I'd, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about this learning system, if you will. All right, I will. And I don't want to forget that dessert that I put together when we had dinner. <laughs> <laughs> if, you can, if, Sorry. if you can tell me something oh, I, what I, that was. <laughs> Never mind. Let me, <laughs> let me answer your question. Who, okay. who wants to hear about food anyway? We'll, we'll, just, we'll talk we'll, about we'll, that later. <laughs> so, because um, um, I constructed it with the rhythm knowledge protocol. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, so well, how, how can I break this down? What, 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 help me out here. Well, so. What, what's, what, what's the one thing you're looking for when I describe this, this system? I guess, uh, you know, obviously it's way too expansive for you to like make an elevator <clears throat> pitch, but I guess, um, how, you know, if someone was looking for uh, instructional material, you know, what is it that's unique about this that would bring them to your work? Okay. I got that one. Um, and in fact, I'm before this podcast, I'm, I'm putting together a promo video for my Zoom classes this weekend. You know, I'm in the middle of, uh, I opened up for some private lessons this week. It's been so much fun, you know, and people oh, wow. are coming in from everywhere. But the, the, the point is, in that promo, it, I, I'm going to say something that I'm about to uh, say to describe the system. The system is meant to be a companion to learning anything on any instrument because you know, you learn about things with signs. Sometimes <clears throat> evidence isn't enough for something because it can be skewed, it can be lied about, it can be hidden. You know, we're not sure. Evidence is an interesting thing to prove something. Sometimes signs are, are a way. So a sign of what this, this, this book system is or this learning system is, is that there are no exercises at all <laughs> in oh, wow. the first book. So that tells you something. What it does is it allows a person to understand how to learn whatever exercise on whatever instrument in whatever way. It, it helped me. It helped me to learn how to shoot darts better because I I don't know if I'm out with my buddies. I would like to hit the double twenty if I'm supposed to hit the double twenty. Yeah. You know, it allows for great um, a, a very quick acceleration with hand-eye coordination skills and also behavioral change. But that's a whole other subject because emotion gets in the way. It's why I can't, it's why I have a hard time changing some things about me because I'm emotional about them. It's very difficult to get through that, all that electrochemical stimulation to make a change. But anyway, this allows you to know how to work meaning, meaning what is it I'm supposed to think and when am I supposed to think it? In other words, if I'm going to learn this thing, 
called a paradiddle. And for non-drummers, you know, we have these words like, like who made up the word paradiddle, right? Or the <laughs> ratamadiddle of Q, like it's funny stuff. But this paradiddle, which is a simple right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, sticking. What is the point? What is the point of having someone show you what that is if they don't talk about what you're supposed to do to position your body, what you're supposed to look at, what you're supposed to listen to as opposed to hear, and finally, what you're supposed to feel. Because what we feel is the, what you feel is the only way to actually play something is through the sense of touch. And so most musicians learn by ear, but that is, it's why they just play. They don't learn, they play. There's a difference. Yeah. Um, you want to learn by eyesight <clears throat> and by your sense of touch, has a sort of visual aspect. So someone that's blind could say, well, then your system's no good because I can't see. But it's, it's not the case because there are, there's, a, there's a way that, that those senses connect cognitively, you know, in the brain. Anyway, you don't learn by ear. You play by ear. You're a musician by ear. So this system reorders your thoughts according to the sense of sight, the sense of touch, and then the sense of hearing because hearing is how you evaluate what it is you've done. Your sense of touch means, okay, I, I know what that double stroke feels like. I know what that paradiddle is supposed to do when I throw my hand down and squeeze from this muscle at a very specific time to get that bounce. Instead of sitting there, old school going, okay, like you, I, I have to talk to some 38-year-old person, like what they're like five, okay, now play nice and slow, like everyone says, put a metronome on, Right, left. No, 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 no. That, that's just an initial learning what something is. That's not learning how it works. So rhythm knowledge says, all right, okay, look it. This is what it is. Let's get let's get over that quickly. Great, you understand it. Cool. Now let's get to the good stuff because you're studying from this person, and my other five students are studying from these three people, and these people buying my videos or whatever, renting them. They're they're. They're studying from two other people, whatever it is. So it's like, wait a minute, what you gotta learn from me is how to take that scale, that rhythm, and that thing, and actually retain it and put it in there and be able to call upon it when you wanna be a better musician. So yeah. it's about what to think and when to think it, which is completely different than opening up a book and looking at rights and lefts or notes. Yeah, for sure. It's almost like the unnecessary precondition <coughs> to learning it, yeah. this stuff. Um, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. I'm not a uh, drummer at all, and now I want to go. I, I saw on your website there's a way to uh, go on to, I think, Vimeo and rent some of the videos as well. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, if you're not a drummer, one of them called the clockwise, counterclockwise limb system treats the four fingers of a guitarist, a neck hand, or a saxophone player, or whatever. And whatever player you are that uses fingers, or you use your limbs to hit stuff, <clears throat> um, this system orders, it oh, this is so important, it orders your ability to go through the exercise system, which changes everything. It's not the same as isolating these two fingers, or these two, or these two. Well, these two limbs is, is a completely different animal, so anybody can use it. And the not quite double counting system turns any possible rhythm you could ever perceive, just like, or actually you can't perceive it yet, that, that you would listen to and expose yourself to. You'd know how to recognize the pattern and process it so that you can enjoy it. How are you supposed to enjoy something or say, oh, that's musical, that's not musical, if you don't even have a radio to tune into a radio station? And yet, you know, we all know we all can make comments, the world can make comments about things they have no clue about. They no experience whatsoever. Like, oh, that's not, that's this, that's that. It's like, oh, wow, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You don't even have the radio station. You never even listen to the radio station. Well, how can you talk about the radio station and the music? You don't even have a radio. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's heavy stuff, very heavy stuff. Um, and it's really essentially. It, it makes, ahead. it's very sensible at creating a frame of reference. Like we do that in all other kinds of areas of our lives. I think um, what you've done is you've, you've, uh, you've created this. I'm unaware of any other musician taking this approach in, in their instruction. So. No, there, there aren't any, <clears throat> um, except a lot of years ago, 
a man named Gary Chester, who wrote a drum book called The New Breed, was on to this kind of thing. Like, he got it. Um, and, and, and again, sometimes a sign is it says more than any of the words that a person could use or how we all act. Like, we say one thing and do another. Like, forget all that stuff. But the cover of his book was a sign that he knew what was going on. It was a, it was a, uh, a drum set that was uh, had symmetry oh, in yeah. places. And in the book, um, he referred to the use of the human voice to say a, a, a pulse, timing, which is exactly the way to do it because you fit your limbs into time. But us musicians, we don't want to take that time. We don't want to count. We don't want to... We don't want to do any of that. We just kind of want to play. But if you'd like to get to a different level or learn something new, that's the quickest way to do it. So no, there is nobody doing it. Um, and um, uh, that's one person that I became aware later um, definitely was on to this. So, um, so you, you had created this rhythm knowledge approach and published these books. And yeah. then it was it was not long after that you wound up at Berkeley, right, as an yes. instructor. And I know you were an associate instructor, uh, but then later, I think, full-time. Um, and you served as a student advisor. Um, we talked about the sort of student response um, success you had being so highly rated. Um, what did, what did, um, how did Berkeley influence how you thought about uh, music instruction did it change or was it more you had developed so much it was an opportunity to, to share it in a, in a you know more programmatic way well it was both um, okay. first of all it's like every situation I get in no matter what the situation is <clears throat> I'm not arriving I'll put it this way that's like a lot of occurrences and situations that uh, happen with dream theater that, that people are curious about um, as far as my role or what my role is not. Um, you know, my, my parents would, would frequently say, don't ever go into somebody's house and open their refrigerator. Right. <laughs> don't do Makes it. Sense. Oh, you know, it's like, you know, it's like we, we don't care if you see someone else do it. You don't do that. Right. Okay. Um, so when I go into a situation, I am looking for them to express their concerns and needs and uh, for them to be as comfortable as they can while I would like to bring a whole lot to the table in a way where I'm not opening the refrigerator and <laughs> deciding to you know, serve dinner in the house. No. So that's the whole thing. When I went to Berkeley, what I wanted to grab from there was, first of all, there's a, these amazing teachers here. I would like to get to know them all and, and, and absorb what it is that, that they went on journeys to discover that I did not. And like, so what is it that they can bring to me in the span of a 10 minute conversation? And they spent 10 years on this. Yeah. Are you kidding? Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to learn? So uh, I had that. I also have always learned from students. I learned that right from the get go when I first started teaching that I have learned as much about this rhythm knowledge. In fact, rhythm knowledge exists because of students. It exists because of people looking at me and saying, why should I do that? Yeah, and me and me not saying because I said so. I mean, it is you know in some conditions I suppose that because I said so is necessary. <laughs> but um, now finish that dessert, Peter, because I said so. It's going to be really delicious. <laughs> um, but 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 the thing is, um, you know, I, I I wanted to get gather info and I wanted to bring my way of of doing this specific teaching things so that the students who studied from other teachers could absorb what they were saying in a way that was inherently rhythm knowledge and that the, no other teacher had to worry about it um, because they're all great anyway. And they all, you know, when someone's a great teacher, they, they do, in, in essence, they do this anyway. When they are a great teacher, they, they explain these, these sorts of things and this perspective on learning. But that whole thing, man, was like, I was brought in there by Dean Anderson, and he, he sought me out. He targeted me. He asked me for a, quite a, a bit, like some years. And um, the situation just, it lended itself to it one day. 
And so um, I went in there. He had these plans for me that I didn't understand. You know, he's like, no, this is what you're going to do. I'm like, oh, okay. Let me just, you know, I'm not, I'm in your house. Uh, what do you need me to do here? So um, I went in with that attitude and he made me a counselor. It's not just an advisor. You are a psychological counselor. And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like who, like, what, what, what is this business of, you know, uh, counseling? I, does anyone have a degree in this? Like, what, do we, what am I going to say? I mean, this is important. You, you are trying to describe a, a, a change for a human being that, that they could listen to and end up in a bad place, a medium place, or a good place. Like, whoa. So I was like, no, I, I, could, I could never do that. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, you can. Yeah, you just you don't know it yet. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So it was monumental. It was very helpful for me to learn. Yes, I can. Yeah, you know what? He was right. I can help people. I became a tutor. Uh, I tutored all kinds of uh, academic things. I mean, I had done that anyway, even to survive. When I was 19, I, I was, uh, uh, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. No, but this I, is um, good. I, um, you know, I had to survive. I had to survive. And I was at a, a, a college and you know, not working and making any money. I was like going to make it big and play music and whatever. And that didn't happen. So I would, uh, I would do people's homework for them, and I would tutor them uh, in the software programming and do the calculus homework. Because thankfully, you know, most people don't know how to do it, and I, I recognize that. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, uh, I traded, I traded the homework on integral, uh, in, in integral functions for ham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Did you have any? Do you have any ham? Oh you know, my gosh. I'll, that's yes, awesome. I will take I will take a half a pound of ham, and I will I will do. I'll, I'll do your integral <laughs> functions <laughs> for ham. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry, I gotta wipe my eyes. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Uh, well, you know, I mean, all kidding aside, I've learned that I'm one of the, sorry. the what I said. All kidding aside, one of the best ways I've always found to um, figure something out for yourself is figure out how you would try and teach teach it to somebody because you really have to organize your thoughts um you know it, it's it's one thing for a lot of musicians who are instinctive to do uh, and and I, that's that's valid but it's another thing entirely to be able to break it down and say here's how I do it um here's how I could communicate it so someone else could understand it and sort of profit by what I do that's a very different skill it, it is and I, I'll tell you a uh, um Something that used to happen that I noticed after I took on this counseling role was um, after, you know, a year, uh, I was teaching three semesters a year, like in the summer ended and, you know, sometimes it was uh, more around the holidays too, but I would have a really emotional moment where I thought, I cannot do this job anymore. I, I, I just, I, I can't be here anymore and do this because these people are looking to me for things I can't provide. Um, mm -hmm. It's so deep for me. It's so emotional. I, I can't do it. I, but then I would go back and do it, and I would get better at it. And then I would say the same thing again and get emotional about it. I just say, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. There's no way. I'm not. I, who's listening to me? Who do I listen to? I'm not Mr. Advice. Why would anyone want to listen to what I have to say? Uh, but it turns out that I did figure out. I didn't realize how how important the in essence of rhythm knowledge, which became the grid, right? The grid is how I, I problem solve now. But um, I didn't realize how important it was to have a perspective, and that you could teach it to anybody, and that and that that person could actually step out of their emotional moment and see what it is they need to do. So instead of uh, running away from it, I I, uh, I embraced it and I took it on. But what really what really made me feel uh, as well as I've ever felt in my life was I. I, I just put a general email out to the students um, one semester, and I just said, you know, but all of them that I had, I had all email addresses, and I said, you know, can you write me something that I could use for my, my, my evaluation? I'm being evaluated as a professor. Could you write something for me to include in my portfolio? And I got 200 of the most emotional, I, I, I cried a little bit. I was like, oh, my God. Wow. I can't That's believe cool. these people said this, that this happened. Like, one example was um, I had a student that had a brain tick such that his right foot 
couldn't really maintain anything on the bass drum pedal and he was told by surgeons that's that's just the way it is is a brain surgery thing it's 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 like a car engine that doesn't have the pistons like i'm sorry there are no pistons in your engine it's not gonna go and i was like no I, I, let's just try something you know if it doesn't work what's what's the big deal and what i did as I talked him through the basic rhythm knowledge one philosophy of using the eyes and talking to your body and talking to your body over and over lift the leg flex the calf lift the leg and it got rid of the tick wow. for the most part and he just lost it you know he wrote me the most wonderful letter so um anyway the point is that yeah it's a really incredible thing to do it's 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 you know it's like it's more important than yeah. this, uh, in a way, but without this, it doesn't exist. So it's just important in different ways. No, that's absolutely true, Mike. Um, one of my favorite writers included a. He was a, a an educator and um, taught high school, and he wrote in the foreword of one of his books, which I've always remembered. He said, "A a, a good teacher can touch eternity, but so can a bad one." <laughs> you know, which is to say, be a good one. Um, and it, it, clearly you've done that and the, the thoughtfulness with which you've approached, um, how to teach is, is showing dividends. And it's, um, there's, there's a lot of research that's gone into this, this whole idea of rhythm and motion, um, helping, um, people learn, helping their, their executive skills in, in problem solving, um, creating plasticity in their neural pathways. Like there's all this stuff. And they, the, the, the simplest way it was broke down in a, in a paper I read kind of preparing for this. And this is not my, my field of expertise, but uh, I, I read up on it and it, it said, think about doing head, shoulders, knees, and toes, but doing it in saying it out loud, but doing it in reverse. What happens is it, is it engages the mind. Like you do the other by rote. And so they, they found that if they do these kinds of just simple rhythm things with kids, that they, they have better verbal skills, they have better retention. They, um, um, and and part, of, <clears throat> part of what's happening now is they're, they're acknowledging the value of music uh, education for creating these, this, the skill of learning it, it writ large. So what's remarkable about what you've done is you, like, you know, you pioneered this. You were doing this before they even acknowledged that this was true. And you have students who are overcoming, you know, potential obstacles to, um, you know, excel at things they love. And I think that that's amazing. So uh, that that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's, okay. it's a nice, uh, nice, nice result. Yeah, and it's cool. I mean, you know, where you are in your altitude career, um, you're still giving back by teaching lessons. I mean, uh, I don't even take drums and if i was in boston i'd be over there <laughs> um are you are you are your zoom lessons you know, wait 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 you can be in guam and come in Sign okay so up. tell tell us real quick about this so you're doing this virtually then oh yeah i really got into uh which is why i'm surprised about that noise it must have been a feedback thing because i i've never done this before i like put a microphone on the computer that takes care of uh, okay. you know, me, me, me broadcasting here, or the, just the Zoom, the Zoom application. Anyway, um, but I took a lot of time to nurture this with the lighting and, and, and every microphone. There's no phasing. This, like, oh my gosh! So I am teaching. I do uh, I do labs, which means that there are multiple people in, in one class for for cheap money. And um, that was a wonderful, I mean, people learn from each other. And I finally this week opened up some private lessons. I thought I would give it a shot before I get busy, yeah. you know, in May, and then maybe come back to this and, and open up some slots. So I'm broadcasting, I'm doing things like this, and it's all wired. I, I can do anything here from putting music through it and metronome and my drums and, yeah. you know, the whole bit and That's whatever. I can also, you know. That's right. That's really cool. Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll um, well, I'll put a link to your website because I know that there's a there's a some some places there where you can get to. I think um, approaching you about scheduling and all of your other materials. By the way, for people who maybe want the books and the videos, um, let's transition at the end here and let's um, let's talk a little bit about Dream Theater. So. Um, 
I, I want to tell you a, a quick story. I, I was one of those because I'm a fan that watched the whole uh, audition thing. Um, and uh, there was a moment in your tape, uh, your your webisode, where you, you effectively said, um, I, I, I don't can look at this like getting a gig. To me, it's, uh, it's not it's the wrong word. Like, I, I want to be in the band. And there was something in my head triggered and said, that's going to be the guy. Because it was very, it, it, you know, as great as all of the, the players were, there was just, there was something different about, I don't know, just the, the internal thought process about, about that. And, of course, then you had a great audition and the rest is history. Um, but I, like, I, I would have been surprised after hearing that. There was just something about your thoughtfulness that I think signaled your, how you would mesh with the band, um, not just as a player, but as a personality. Um, and I think that's proven true. Um, so I, I wanted to I, I wanted to to say that, but I wanted to ask you. Um, you you know I you probably know this, but you tomorrow will be the tenth anniversary of the official announcement of you being in the group. I know you'd already been received by the band, but the 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 official press release that told the world you were a Dream Theater drummer is ten years ago tomorrow. So the, wow. there's a milestone for you. Um, 10 yeah. years, I know you just um, have finished recording the fifth studio album um, and then a bunch of live work. So, you know, congratulations. That's, uh, that's a feat in and of itself. Um, but tell us a little bit, if you, I know there's not a lot you can talk about the record. And I, so I'm going to focus more on process, but I would like to know, like, um, before we get into that, like, what, what could you say about this, this forthcoming record, even if it's just enthusiasm? No, I, I, I can say quite candidly and clearly that this was the, um, uh, the pinnacle of a group effort, at least with the music, at least as far as the music is concerned. It was a pinnacle of a group effort um, having to do with normal things like time going by for people to really get to know more about each other, about each other's playing and about each other. And it was like, um, I, have you ever seen any Bugs Bunny episodes with, with, with the two gophers? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I do, yeah. I'm just old enough so to see all, all of it. <laughs> so like, oh, uh, indubitably, I'll, no, I'll hold the door for you. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll hold the door for you. No, 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 I insist. So that really is kind of like dream theater writing music where we – you know, well, what, what do you what, what do you have to say? No, 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 really, play. Or, or, or what do you think I should play? And we, you know, we spend as much time suggesting things to each other, which is nuts because we're known to be able to do all these things and play all these things. I'm like, who would tell any of us what to do? Blah blah blah. Right. We're in there going, ah, gah, gah. you know, can you hit it? You know, John, can you get an O minus out of that? Mike, can you not hit that? That's a can you, can you maybe hit the snare on the beat and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Jordan, hey, man, I'm playing this. John, my young, saying things. So it's like people I have so much respect for each other uh, making this group thing. And, 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 you know, the album as a whole, the essence of the album is this, although there are ebbs and flows. There's, uh, you know, there's maybe one song that's a little bit more, straight ahead laid back kind of a thing because that's the rest is frantic you know when 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 when, when you look at it, when you look at it like this or a section that you know it's just like you start to picture like the hills and the, and the sound of music and whatever it is you know very cinematic as you know dream theater music can be yeah um so it's 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 got all the elements of it but you know the the feeling in here from the thing as a piece of work, as the, from the whole thing, not just like someone hearing a snippet or a first release or the second release and just like judging on, a, on one or two. It's just like the whole thing. You're gonna get, you're gonna get that group effort. So that's a, a, a great thing to, yeah. to say about that. No, I I think it speaks to. I mean, it seems to me, and here you can also correct me if I'm wrong, but. The, the longer we've gone on, the more integral you've become to the compositional process. Um, is, that, is that accurate? It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's taking a long, 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 long time. I mean, um, 
you, again, you know, I'm not opening someone's refrigerator door still. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, there's so much more that I do. Yeah. There's so much more. I mean, this, the, the engineering, the sound, the production, all of that stuff. I mean, I'm not tapped in any way, shape, or form for that kind of thing, you know, in, in, this, in this band. But I'm tapped into, um, as, a, as a person in the room, suggesting ideas, and more so now, I'm playing notes on a, on a keyboard because it's my way of communicating. I mean, I don't mean, it's not like Jordan is going to set up a drum set and go, oh, I'm going to set up a drum set now and like show you what to play or I'm going to set up a keyboard and it's not like that. It's just that I don't want to be a drummer back there howling out notes completely out of tune or it's just suggesting things that just, you know, it's just better to be able to communicate saying, can, can we maybe try going uh, using a C sharp and there would be a reason. I'm not saying it just to say it. Sure. You know, or there's, you know, a lot of the bluesy riffs. I mean, I have a whole solo album that's unreleased right now. Musically, musically it's uh, it's been done for quite a while. It's just it's just this bluesy bass heavy it's got that kind of thing sort of to it. So when I play stuff, that's what I'm suggesting is that kind of thing. And then it goes through the filter and ends up changed. Notes change and this and that and the whole bit. But, uh, you know, for me to offer that was more on this record than it was on Distance Over Time. But on Distance Over Time, it was all over the record. Um, and it wasn't on the at all on the previous one. So it's like, you know, yeah. it's like I'm creeping in and a little, you know. Yeah. Whatever, I, I don't know. I mean, we're just going with the flow. It depends on what the direction is going to be and what the use of me is as a person coming into it. So, yeah, that's what I, it is. It, you know, from the outside looking in, it, it, it does feel like the, the, the integration process is, <clears throat> is uh, amplified over time. Uh, and it, it, uh, I, I love how you describe this sort of mutual deference where people are, are offering ideas and it's not out of hand, the dismissal. It's like, oh, let's consider it that. And then maybe it gets changed as you guys brainstorm it through. Um, that's, I, I have to say, having been in my share of bands, that's, a, that's somewhat unique. Um, you don't always have that kind of uh, like mutual respect and, and deference. So, uh, and, I, and there's been, uh, you know, I've spoken to a couple of your bandmates. I know that there's a, a sense that... Um, there's something special about this record. Uh, I think I, I read a quote where you talked about, you know, you guys are in your mid fifties and yet this record seems as energetic as anything you've ever written. Is that, is that a fair statement? Uh, sort of. We're like mid upper fifties. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. yeah like mid fifties. That's fine. <laughs> I gave oh, you yeah, a few years. Was, yeah, yes, it is. I mean, you know, the whole thing is us getting together and, I know what my, my, my offering beforehand was, you know what, it's, I would like to throw everything out the window and go in that room and, and pretend we're like 18 in a room and just want to want to play our instruments. Let's just play stuff and do things and like make patterns and, you know, work on it together and just, just do it and just like kill it. That's, that's all I wanted to do. And I said it literally like that. And we went in the room. And uh, everyone had things to say, too, you know. Sure. But, um, so that's what it is. You know, one thing this record isn't is, uh, and I don't want it to come across like this, is like, oh, my gosh, this is our best, our best record. And like, anytime someone says that yeah, and I yeah. read that, I'm like, no, I actually like these albums better than this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I'm not going to say that because it just, it just causes a, it's like an impossible situation. Yeah, you, it's an untenable argument. You, yeah. You, yeah, you can't win that one. Yeah. You know, so what, what, what this is, it's like, this is just simply us going in a room like we're 18 and playing our instruments and our, musically. Anyway, you know, I wasn't a part of the process after writing music, recording my parts. It's just, it's just like, as usual, I'm out of there. I'm, that's, the, all, that's all I get. That's all I do. That I'm out. And I go home and I work on other things. Um, but up to that point, you know, so we were clear what my role is and what my role is not. And so within that spectrum, within that uh, set of tasks, this record is just that. It's just this, I, I, just go in and have fun. I mean, like, yeah. you know. 
You can, um, you can see, Mike, this is one of the compliments I wanted to pay you. You can see the absolute joy you derive from playing your instrument when you play live. Uh, and that is in the context of absolutely amazing drum work. And, and it, um, one of the part and parcel of this statement for me, and, and folks who listen to my stream and know me are going to hear this again and again, and I've said it before, and that is there's this false dichotomy that gets sort of regurgitated all the time about um, technique versus soul. And it's as if these things are mutually exclusive. The, the ability to do so many different things with skill is somehow soulless. And by contrast, doing something that's really remedial and straight ahead, but with, you know, hit really hard and loose or whatever the hell they say is, is more soulful. Um, and I, 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 I um, reject this entirely. And with, with you, what I hear, uh, and I know that music is forever personal, but what I hear is I hear a, a drummer who has spent so much time on, on craft and technique and then, and then through, and then to develop the facility to deliver his soul in the music. And when you do that, it's so clear. It makes you happy. It's so fun to watch you play. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, you know, I should share something you might be interested in. I know people would be interested in it, but the actual job for me um, since, uh, I don't remember if it was the, the third tour or just like after the first record, my, uh, my job description morphed and changed to being the person that has to be the clock for a massive production, a yeah. massive show. It's so meticulous. I mean, in my, I mean, when I say meticulous, I'm talking like, if, if a certain thing I'm hitting is not, and I mean, is not within a few milliseconds of where it's supposed to be hit, the sound between that and something coming off the video or whatever is going to flare. It's going to sound awful. Yeah. So I've got this like, this. I'm in, I'm in rails, like, a, like I'm on uh, a railroad track. I cannot go off. I, I have to, even with my body language, I have to be very, it's almost like I look, uh, I'm not, as, I'm not as, as loose or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Um, I am very, very, I'm very aware and I'm, I, that I have this job to do and all this stuff is going on and everybody is gravitating over time, week after week after week, into this insane level of tightness <clears throat> that becomes a thing. Yeah. We have so much fun. We have so much fun. I mean, when we leave that stage after a concert and we've been out there for a while, we know, we, we know if somebody's pick slid on a note a little early, if I hit a, <laughs> you know, oh, good Lord, I hit the wrong symbol that wasn't on the part on the other record, and oh, my gosh, I can't play the music right, and I played a different thing, whatever they say, right? But it's like if this stuff is not like, you know, zing, <laughs> you can hear it in our ears. We know it. So we, we, we've really developed this tightness that's incredible, and it, it's so much, uh, there's so much joy to pull it off. Yeah. So it's not necessary. I just want to, I want to uh, kind of, target the kind of joy that it is because there's immediate joy of you know i'm just feeling the groove and the vibe and the this and that and the other thing and doing it but then you listen to it later or that's the show that got made into a a, a release and you're like oh my gosh ah no that is not my intention so it's about intention meaning it's all fine and good and all that in the moment but then what happens when what's your intention how do you want the song to actually sound? You know, that's a conversation that's important with any band I, or people I work with or whatever. It's like, what is, what is it that you want for the result? How, how is it that you want this song to actually sound? If we want it to sound this way, you know, we've, we've got to play it in a certain way and maintain a certain kind of clock or whatever it is to get it to, to be this thing that we want it to be. We can change that. Sure. It's not one better than the other. It's just like, it's just, it's just defined. So this, it's a hard job. I mean, I'm playing uh, music under this premise. It's not the same as playing music without this right. monster thing. That's just amazing because the result is just so like, 
when yeah. you hear it later, I mean, when we listen to a show that we've done and we're like, we can release that. That's just not normal. That's just not normal. Yeah, you, you know, and it's just like good. It's really something. It is, and I, I, um, I, I, I take part of your point there, which I think is that in the context of such uh, an elaborate production with that requires such precision, there's there's got to be some personal joy and gratification for getting it right because getting it wrong that's, would be disastrous. It. Yeah, yeah, it is exactly right, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's um, there are. There are more cell phones in the air than faces just absorbing it. It's oh my gosh, so yes. strange. It is so weird to be to be the person up there. Because you you grow up being the person on the other side and you're like, I know why I went to concerts and everything, and I know I get it. Yeah. I get well, that's a great visual. I want to remember this and take a picture, I want to take a video. I'm not talking about that. That's that's not that's fine. People shouldn't do that and have a good time. Sure. They should absolutely enjoy themselves. But it's like, it's become an obsession or a thing where it's like, I don't know how some of those arms, they talk about me with the symbols in the air. They talk about me with the symbols in the air. What about them with our cell phone up all night? I mean, how, doesn't that hurt? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See? Well, you know, you know what I mean? the most disastrous effect of that for people in the audience is when someone's holding their arms up to, to video a song, you, it, it, it's an obstruction. You can't see. You know, put it put aside the like the philosophical debate of you know should you be present to enjoy it versus capture it, um, and and how does that mitigate the you know the the emotional experience? You know, people can decide yeah. where they land on that, but when you get in in my way, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a problem. Um, yeah. Well, here's a here's a related question for you, to all of this. Then, when in the context of a show, and I guess this would change show to show, are there particular songs that you like a mentally have to sort of gear up for because they just, they kind of push all your buttons <sighs> or, or by the time you kind of get to the road, is it like, you know, you've, you've dialed in what the show looks like and then it's just really get, getting on these rails you talk about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of, it's all the same. It has to be all the same to me because uh, that way I can keep my state of mind in the same place. That way I can keep my protocols it working the same way and I don't have to change it every now and then, you know? So, um, yeah, it's pretty much approached. I mean, and it, it, it morphs and changes over time with more comfort. Yeah. You know, this is, you, you gotta, people you need to know this for these tours, the, let's just say there's five days of preparation. Four of those days are spent twisting knobs, aiming lights, changing something with somebody's instrument. Yeah. Um, so little of it is spent playing the song. And for me, it's been like, well, you have to, you have to do all this stuff. It's like, we, use, well, we can play the song. So, okay, we're not going to worry about that. But not, not really, not really. I mean, like I haven't had a chance to play. I've never played some of these. That's a whole different thing. It's like, yeah. can I play? So for many of these tours, I've had the opportunity to play. What people see me play the first night, one full time through, at most two, sometimes some of them three. Um, mostly it's in packets and pieces in order to work the production because you have to, you have to play to a certain point and go, okay, well, let's do this and right. someone's going to change the lights and someone's going to realign the video and someone's gonna you know it's gonna da, 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 da. it's like this isn't like someone learning a dream theater song in their basement or their bedroom yeah. and then filming themselves and playing on youtube i mean this is a this is that is a 0.08 and what i'm talking about is a 275 that there's a difference in what it feels like to actually live through that and do that with, with, without the time you need. And then I got to go out and do that, which is why I'm there. That is, that is why I got the job, yeah, you know, I... is, 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 is to do that. So I just sharing, um, sharing the depth of, of what we all have to go through. It's a very serious amount of preparation. I was and, gonna uh, say the yeah. two things that it makes me think is that before you arrive for whatever amount of prep that you do as a group to put the production together, there has to have been serious amount of personal, personal prep. And then 
there has to just be like I watched when I rewatched the the audition and they they got to the point where they were doing some jamming and they were you guys were like feeding back time signatures and stuff so that you could essentially improv against really difficult sort of time changes uh, uh, and time signatures. Um, I was like, it, it, they would Dream Theater needs a guy who can do that with enough efficiency that they don't have to do rehearsals for a month to go on on the road. So, I mean, it speak it, it 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 like it. What it made me think of, Mike, is it's not like you were just sitting around waiting for the call from Dream Theater someday to come because you know you're a good drummer. You spent a lifetime um, developing your craft as an instructor, as a as a live musician, as a recording musician, doing all kinds of things, um, so that when the time came, and not that you knew that it would, but like you stepped into that role with all the requisite skills. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, that's what happened, uh, and we're all that's, the, that's what happened. We're 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 happy that you're there. Um, Thank you. Um, Okay, so just a couple of last questions for you. Here's kind of just a color question. Do you have a like a favorite song to play live? Is there one that somehow just gets you in the gut and you're like, yeah, let's do this? No, uh, absolutely not. Uh, it, it, and, it, and it varies from week to week or different okay. nights and months and whatever. I mean, one of them that was a joy uh, m more so was Pale Blue Dot. Mm. Pale Blue Dot was... Uh, yeah, that was a fan favorite too. Very, very kind of throwback, cool, progressive tune. Um, yeah. So now let's talk just a little bit about your life beyond music entirely. You've done some visual art. Yes, um, I was um, uh, tapped to <laughs> go in a room with the lights out <laughs> and lighted drumsticks and play drums and be filmed at a what I believe was a five second exposure or two it was two and a half was it two and a half second or five I think it was a five second exposure whatever whatever okay. a long exposure and I was gonna play so um, I decided that I wasn't just gonna do that because uh, like just go in and not prepare for it and just oh I'm gonna play the drums because it would look messy to me it would look messy so I decided how can I communicate what what I am, not just who, like what yeah. am I, what, what do I do, you know? And it was, um, uh, it was about symmetry. So what I did is I, t without a metronome, I timed shapely moves that were symmetrical on the drums so that the amount of time, uh, the, no, the amount of shapes, repetitive shapes that I would do um, within one second, so 60 beats a minute, would uh, would appear a certain way after a five second exposure or whatever oh, the second wow. exposure was. Okay. So that's where, and I, uh, that, that's where, like, I have them behind me. I have them behind me. They, they, they were all done with that kind of precision, but they're not, you see, the beauty of them, I think, is that they're not perfect because otherwise a person would just take a picture and you know, and fold it in half and make it perfectly symmetrical. That's not fun. Right. Yeah, that's not fun. Anybody can do that. Do it for real. So I wanted to do it for real, and that's what I did. And I called it Beyond Plank, having to do with plank time and the plank length. Beyond it, there was a reason I called it. That. How cool! But, um, I don't know a lot about the. You're talking about the plank constant, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah well, the actual physical properties of time and space yeah okay that's a i don't know enough about that but that could be a whole it's all conversation but it's really cool neither to see I, you I, neither, neither do i don't <laughs> it's really cool to see you like having these other expressive sides um which brings me to the question beyond um beyond music and beyond things you've done is there some creative Effort. I guess it doesn't even need to be creative, but is there another like mountain that Mike Mangini wants to climb? Something when time permits that you want to put your heart into and go and try and do? Oh boy. Well, I mean, for, firstly, um, they can find my art at Mike Mangini art. Uh, oh yes, that's right. That's four. right. You just, just, yeah, you just, just put that up there so people can find it. I will. Um, but, uh, or they can get through, through my, all my websites are all connected. So anyway, to answer your question, look at, my time outside of music is spent, so it's split. 
I have responsibilities in life. I have to take care of people and houses sure. need maintenance. Things need maintenance. People need maintenance. Life stuff. I, <laughs> I need maintenance. These maintenance things from my mind and my body and my spirit and my families and everything and the physical properties of things. It's just like, that's like the bulk of the time, but I know what you asked me. And um, I, I, I really just want my, I want, I really want my solo record released. And I really want to make a lot more videos because uh, on demand, because what I need to open up is the connection between these systems and other aspects of life that I've used to tutor, to tutor people academically with things I don't even have to know that well or have to know that well based on the way the system works. I don't have to know them that well. I have to know what they are. I have to know how they work and I have to know enough about something but not all that much. Um, and no, who, who can do that anyway? You know, I'm, I'm not one of, I don't know everything. I'm not even a musical jukebox. I don't even know a lot of songs. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not even like a musician's musician. I'm sort of like an athlete that decided to play drums uh, and a, you know, a guy that likes physics and math things and yeah. equations and, you know, other things, you know, whatever. I happen to just do that. I don't know. But um, bottom line is that I would like to pursue these other academic things and put them together and uh, try to make something of it. But I really want more of my solo music out. So I, I also have a ton of music that I have that I have, you know, in, in pieces that I, I do here and um, I want to get that out. It's just not time yet. Yeah. I, I, you know, I read a, a great quote some time ago saying, it was, do, do what's necessary, then you can do what's possible, then you can do the impossible. Mm. It's a St. Francis of Assisi quote and um, it just came to me almost daily like, uh, I, I get a lot of those overviews from different sources and magazines or news, whatever it is. But um, I read that and it stopped me for a it's minute. It's a great so quote. I have to do what's necessary right now. You know, we got a dream theater stuff to prepare for. I, I'm teaching, I'm keeping this going, I'm focusing on the classes and I'm making videos and writing, you know, constantly. I have a database of lyrics a database of lyrics, a lot of them, um, uh, and, and music riffs, just I, literally I've got 300 easy, 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 easy. So, you know, I got to do something with all that. So the, oh, the, that's music though. It's music. Sorry. No, about but, no but that's okay. Like I, I, it was, it was part of the question. I mean, it, the, the thing you, the mountain you may want to climb, which is just my metaphor, maybe, um, yeah, releasing a bunch of this, this music. And, um, right now I know, you guys are gearing up for the next Dream Theater record. But um, I think a lot of us look forward to the day when time permits for you to do the things necessary to get the solo record out. Uh, uh, now you've got me really intrigued. <laughs> uh, oh, it's been sitting there. I know every known of it's been that the music has been done for quite a long time now. Uh, so anyway, there's the other aspect of it that's, that's got to get done and settled and, and all of that. So It'll happen. Yeah. Um, all, you know, all, 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 the, all, all the vocals, the lyrics. I mean, the lyrics have been done for a long time, too. Uh, well, actually, that's not... Whatever. I won't even go into that. They, they may or may... Some may or may not be... Whatever it is. doesn't matter. But there's point a con is, the point is there's a considerable it, solo effort that we're going to get at some uh, undefined <laughs> point in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is really, really great. I want to... Um, I don't want to take any more of your time. I want to... Commend everybody to Mike's website, uh, MikeMangini.com. Um, by the way, I love your lo new logo um, with the the brainwave and the heart uh, the uh, the heartbeat, right? Yeah, my um, uh, my niece Lauren did that. It's really she's cool. A, she's she's so talented. I mean, she's got it. She 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 uh, decided to pick up the guitar one day and won a national songwriting contest oh or my something with her band. I'm not flying <laughs> you. Like, wow, there must be some genes. Uh, she's she's like, no, oh, Uncle Mike, you don't need to do all that stuff. Just play the three chords, make get, make the song, and get it over with. Get it over with. <laughs> well, um, you're she did a great job on the logo. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was in the process of letting folks know on Mike's site. There's so much information, uh, and of course, a really important part of that is you can get through to um, the the various things that he does in terms of. Uh, video instruction, um, uh, there's um, there's written instruction, 
Um, and I, you know, everything you've heard now, I, I think on this stream suggests that Mike is a guy who is passionate about and um, um, sort of very in a leading way, uh, able to help you unlock your own skills. And, and a lot of what he's done are skills that um, help people to succeed at um, things that are not only musical. Um, and I've only just got the tip of the iceberg on it, but I want to be sure and, and uh, direct people, Mike, towards your website to go and take a look at uh, those materials. Um, is you know your your career is so fascinating, and um, I know that I, Dream Theater is amazing, and you're amazing in Dream Theater. But there's uh, there's so many other sides to you, and that was the purpose of us having this conversation. Yeah, and you know, thank you for having me. And to close uh, on my end, you know, that whole other aspect of what I'm doing. You know, there are a lot of people around this world that have more in common than they know, and um, uh, a lot of us need. Or a lot of us are in need uh, of all kinds of things that in every way, shape, or form, just you need stuff, you know, to survive. And yeah. you need a lot of emotional uh, direction, too. That was part of what I learned with counseling. There are some, there could have been some bad outcomes to some situations that did, that turned out well, you know, because of some proper direction and all that. But um, at the end of the day, you know, thank you uh, for pointing these different, at these different things that I do. But really, the, one of the more unknown important things is, I can make a dessert for you. So I just want you to know something. That's <laughs> that, you? When, we, when we were like choosing a dessert and like Jordan, you know, he knew. He goes, all right, Mike, just do this. And I was like, all right, I got this. Um, first of all, you know, it was, an, it was, it was an, a, a, a called like a, a caraban apple festouche. This is made up thing. And it's like, first of all, the chocolate ice cream is my favorite. But you got to have this with vanilla because the vanilla morphs with the butterscotch topping and chocolate sauce on it, and all the other Sunday accoutrements and a, and the bananas. But you gotta you gotta have the caramel just blasting all over the bananas, a certain whipped cream, and then as you know, at the end of the day, and I had to go through and and really work this, but we got a shot of liqueur, a Tia Maria, and we put it. You remember that, I, right? I do. The, yeah. Oh, the Tia Maria, and you were like, <laughs> you know, and when you when you ate it, it was so much more fun because the spoon and the whipped cream on your nostril, and you're like, mm. yeah, you don't even. Mm, it don't was even, a work like, of art, man. Yeah, it's it's like um, the movie What About Bob, where he's obnoxiously eating the corn. And going, mm. <laughs> Mm, mm, mm. that's what we were doing <laughs> so uh you need you need vanilla ice cream you need butterscotch topping you need chocolate uh, f fudge topping you gotta have the different array of nuts and you gotta have of course the, you know the cherry but the whipped cream or some people prefer cool whip so you can have cool whip if you say it like that or the whipped cream and then you gotta if you're an adult you you have to pour your liqueur of choice over it and that's it. Well, I, the, the, my memory of that was when the guy came and uh, offered the dessert. I can't remember the exact exchange, but it was, it was essentially like, can you do X? And, and then you started to explain it. And you built this in his mind because it, it, it was off the menu. And, and the, the guy finally just said, yeah, okay. And he wrote all the stuff down. Uh, it was it was amazing to watch you order that, and I'm sure that the chef was probably like, "Cool, someone wants to do something creative <laughs> and hey, delicious." Tons of stuff. Yeah. Well, let me let me let you go. I know you've got lots to do. Um, I know yes. that there's some filming coming up for videos for for Dream Theater. We look forward to uh, the artful way you guys release all of that information and stuff. Um, so, uh, thank you for coming on and spending some time, uh, Mike. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Pete, and I'll, I'll talk to you later. All right, man. You take care. Okay. I'm going to hang just for a minute. Yeah. And you're going you're gonna to close. Okay, I'll close perfect. off and we'll, we'll – yeah. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.